everyone, and uh, welcome to this uh, webinar about the future of the residential sector uh, from a global and Swedish perspective, in particular about the build to rent. I'm Ganne Larsson, I'm director at uh, Collius International, based in Sweden, although I uh, worked a lot in UK and I cover uh, the rest of Europe to some extent. And with us, we have uh, a really strong panel and uh, we're also hosting this uh, webinar together with uh, Evischitz Sutherland, uh, Global Apartment Advisors and Fråga Lo. And uh, to, to just uh, set the scene here, we are primarily going to cover how uh, build to rent or multifamily looks from a global perspective in unregulated and regulated markets and how this applies to Sweden. And we will go through the supply and demand and then especially the matches and mismatches we see in the, in the market and primarily discuss how this sector might uh, stand the test of time um, through pandemics and economic cycles and how it might look in 20 years time from now on. With us, speakers and panelists, we have David Woodward, who's CEO at Global Apartment Advisors. You could just give us a, a wave. <laughs> we have Felice Kirkler, uh, Kirkler at uh, Sale Architects. Well, Bill Bateman, Head of UK and European Living at Naveen. We have uh, both Tord Svensson and Angus Ford at Evershed Sutherland. So we've got both Sweden and the UK represented here. We have um, our uh, ex-politician Kent Passion, who's now at Heimstaden. We have um, Mattia Tosti, co-founder of CASA, which is part of Block at Bostad. I have uh, Magnus Kenning, Head of Transactions, Sweden at Aberdeen Standard Investments. We have Niklas Bakjad, Head of Built to Rent at GM. JM. Right, so uh, I'm going to hand over to, to Sverre uh, Thor, my co-host for tonight. Thank you, Gunnar. And then hello, everybody. And I'm happy to be here with this distinguished panel and, and all attendees. Uh, I am a partner at Frogaloo, which is a, a small boutique co consultancy in, in the Swedish real estate market. We, we do communications, market analysis, and, and project management. And uh, just a few points of order before we begin the discussion. I'd like to remind everyone to, to mute their microphones when they're not speaking. And I would like to remind all attendees that you can ask questions in the Q&A. Uh, using the Q&A button at the, at the bottom of your screen. And we will have about 25 minutes of uh, presentations with, with every speaker having about three, three minutes to, to themselves. And then we will have a panel discussion for the remainder of the seminar. So should we begin with discussing the, the the comparing the UK and, and US built to rent markets. David, welcome. Thank you very much. Um, I'm David Woodward. I'm the CEO of Global Apartment Advisors. Uh, we are a uh, advisory and asset management uh, firm based in London. Um, I'm obviously from the States, as you can hear, and I'm, I'm coming to you from uh, Colorado right now. So greetings from the US. Um, I have a couple of slides I'm going to take us through uh, that give kind of the backdrop of U.S. multifamily because that's referenced quite a bit internationally um, because the sector has been around in the United States for several decades. And I often get asked, why is that? And why has the U.S. become uh, kind of the, the, the market that most people look to for a little guidance as to how their built rent sector might evolve? So on this slide... Uh, I won't go through every bullet point, but I just want to draw your attention to a, a couple of key periods in the U.S. Um, and the way that that multifamily, as we call it, uh, came came to be such an important sector in the U.S. Um, very much ties back to the 1970s and even the 1980s, uh, and much of the construction booms and busts that occurred in the U.S. 
were had some kind of government backing or tax uh, driven nature to them. So for example, and I won't go too far into history here, but in the 1980s, there was a there was there were some tax changes uh, that resulted in a huge construction boom throughout most of the 1980s and the inevitable uh, bust uh, in the late 1980s. Uh, and then a, uh, a recession that occurred in 91. And then into the 90s, uh, a, another, another government or, 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 uh, or tax driven event occurred where the REIT, the rules of how REITs were structured and how REITs could be organized was changed in the early 1990s. And so REITs became, it became much more viable um, to manage large scale uh, REITs. And there was a lot of stock that had been built in the eighties as a result of the, of the, of the taxes. And, um, and those were then rolled up into REITs. So really the, the modern US apartment REITs as we know them today, sometimes you hear the, the names of companies like Equity Residential and Avalon Bay, those really came to be in the 1990s. And that's when the the sector really became uh, an institutional began uh, an institutional sector with professional ownership, professional management, uh, and large national portfolios. In the U.S., many of these portfolios of the public companies got to be fifty thousand units or even a hundred thousand units uh, across the country. Uh, next slide, please. So, what happened during that same say 30 year period, if you look, uh, I'll start you off with a chart on the lower left of this slide. And what it shows is the percentage of institutional investment in multifamily as opposed to other real estate asset classes. Historically, office was the, was the preferred real estate investment type for institutional investors, meaning pension funds, insurance companies, endowments, uh, uh, family offices, et cetera. Office really dominated their real estate investing historically. And if you look back uh, to the beginning of that chart in the lower left, which coincidentally kind of mirrors uh, a bit my career in, in real estate, um, you can see that uh, there, was, there was very little investment in multifamily. And then this steady, steady climb, which again mirrors the onslaught of the REITs and institutions realizing what a great investment uh, class that multifamily is in terms of its stability, cash flows, predictability, counter cyclicality, meaning that when times are bad, multifamily sometimes actually performs uh, as well or better than other sectors. And when times are good, it also performs uh, well. It, it certainly can have its corrections, but uh, they tend to be very minor and relatively short lived. And so if you, if you fast forward to today, I guess the, the chart in the upper left is probably best reflective of this. Today, multifamily of the, of the different real estate types makes up over 25% of their investing. So one in every four euros or pounds or, or dollars uh, goes into multifamily versus other product types. Now that chart is a, a good year old. And I would tell you in a post COVID environment, where office is being reevaluated and retail is probably continues to be reevaluated, that percentage into multifamily will clearly approach 30%, if not more. So safe to say that about one third of institutional investment in the US is going into multifamily. That's a lot of money going into multifamily. Um, however, even with that, in the lower right hand corner of this slide, you can see that the majority of multifamily is owned by private investors. It's not owned by REITs or, or institutions. So there's still, even though the US has come a long, long way as a sector in multifamily, it still has plenty of room to go. And in the upper right-hand corner, um, you can see the demand for, for additional apartments that are needed. So generally we need in the US, somewhere between 300,000 and 400,000 apartment units built every year just to keep up with population growth, older apartments that are maybe re repositioned or repurposed or demolished, aging stock. And so you have this continuous cycle of new product coming into the market, product that was built maybe 10 or 20 years ago becomes more affordable, of course, and then eventually pro you know, properties are uh, re repositioned and redeveloped. So uh, it's just a bit of a, 
maybe look into the future is, is if you think about multifamily or build to rent in Sweden or in the UK, this is a bit of how it'll look uh, perhaps going forward, uh, a bit of a reflection of how the US has evolved. Those are the those are the end of my comments on these slides. Thank you very much, David. That's that's excellent. And uh, now I'm going to pass over to Felicia, who's uh, going to say how how the design differs in different countries depending on the market, what you can charge for and not. <laughs> Thank you, David. Um, so hello, everybody. I'm Felicia Crickler. I'm an architect uh, and a director at um, Asael Architecture. Um, we are an architectural practice based um, in London and we specialize in residential development. Um, and I thought that it was, would be quite interesting to use our own journey in the built trend sector as, as a fairly good representation of um, the evolution of the design um, of this tenure from theory to practice um, in the UK. So starting from the beginning, um, it all started with research really um, back in 2008, I would say. Um, and um, as David has pointed out, the UK, uh, the US um, uh, market um, was very attractive um, for us. So we did a number of site visits um, to America. We also went to, um, to Germany, mainly to meet um, local operators, to visit buildings, um, uh, meet building managers um, and also architects to learn about the sort of differences uh, with for sale products. Then following that, we sort of, or in parallel, we really sort of started uh, developing more of a strategic um, sort of uh, body of work, which meant collaborating with uh, industry bodies such as the Urban Land Institute, for example. You can see the guide there, which um, the aim was really to create guides um, that were aimed at um, defining the sort of multiple facets um, that create successful large scale rental developments. Um, but at that time as well, we also worked very closely with um, investors, developers and, and operators in the UK who wanted to create their own design guides, which would set the principles um, and you know, the design principles that would impact on, on the net uh, operating income um, of the places that we would be creating. Following that, the next stage was really moving on to looking at sites, that's what we do best, we're architects. Um, so actually designing projects. Um, and uh, so far we have designed, I think of around 5,000 apartments, um, uh, all of that at different stages, obviously, but um, now about half of our projects, I would say as a practice, um, are specifically build trend projects or um, they are um, sort of part of a build trend offer as part of a larger master plan. Um, and, the, and the last phase really for us is, is really um, over the last five years, I would say, uh, we've really started to um, implement our designs, uh, building projects. And we're now at a really interesting phase where um, actually we can look at these schemes, look back and, and really look at the people and how we have managed to create communities through our designs. Um, and we can really start learning back in a way from users and how they are, um, how people are using the buildings, what is, how is it working for, for the operators of these developments, um, and then feeding back into the design process um, to have a sort of positive evolution going forward. Um, in terms of the trends that we have seen, I think over the last 12 years, the things that we've seen changing is that um, it is not just about the top end market at all. Um, it's really the sort of middle market and the affordable um, uh, side, which um, is really in greatest need uh, of this product in a way. So there's real interest at the moment in the UK from affordable housing providers um, and local authorities to move into this, um, this fair to create sort of mid-market product. The other aspect I would point out is quite often when we look at schemes, um, there seem to be tall um, developments uh, located in, in city centres. And actually we're finding that um, we're seeing a move really of, of sort of focus and, and a great opportunity in terms of the suburban family housing. I'm sure we can talk about it. It's not just the city centre, but it's actually looking at all the building typologies being potential um, 
uh, sort of rental opportunities. And the last point really is um, the interest that the sort of the, the, the design um, research that we've done, um, how it has been of interest in other countries um, around Europe mainly. So we're looking at um, various projects working in collaboration in Spain, Italy, Portugal, um, and it's really about sort of diversifying the products and learning from other residential cultures. May I just uh, ask one thing, Lizzie? Uh, is the one thing, um, in particular, free market, i.e. non-regulated rent market, that you would say is an absolute no-brainer to put in, in a built-to-rent scheme? Because Sweden comes from a place where it hasn't always been uh, viable because the rent hit the, the, the cap quite quickly. What would be the one thing? Sorry, can you just repeat? I didn't quite What would be the one uh, build to rent either amenity or design feature uh, or scheme feature that is the most crucial? Uh, to me, my, my, what I think is really key, it's about um, the sort of back of house operations in a way. Amenities, yes. Um, you know, we have, we sort of have sort of benchmarks, but back of house and how you actually service the building um, how you're thinking about it in terms of rental, you're going to have people move in and out of the buildings far more often and actually thinking about the servicing and how that doesn't impact negatively on, um, on, on residents, I think is really important. That would be my view. Thanks. Thank you very much for that. I think we pass over to uh, the bill at Naveen. Thank you, Gunnar. Yeah, pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you for the sponsors for the invitation. Um, and uh, yeah, it's 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 great to be here and speak about um, you know interesting topic. And you know, I think from our perspective, you know, Nuveen, as many of you probably know, is um, global uh, real estate, really asset manager, investment manager. We manage about 130 billion dollars. Um, globally, and I'm responsible for the European UK living portion of that. And historically, um, you know, we've been a bit on the back foot and as it relates to living and, and going forward, it certainly has become one of the most important sectors for us. Um, as many investors know and have realized the resiliency as, um, as David had kind of pointed to the diversified income stream, all of that uh, makes it really appealing. Um, and we're looking effectively across all life stages. So student through to senior um, and really across Europe as we, as we had outlined. Um, and one of the big macro areas that we have focused on and where we think there's a lot of value and opportunity, especially as more and more capital um, you know, starts identifying this asset class or sector as um, the big opportunity is, where is, um, how, how are these schemes differentiated, right? And a lot of you know, for those of you that attend, uh, you know, conferences by different advisors and read the market reports, there's the constant um, uh, blurring of lines terminology, which effectively shows hospitality um, and, and traditional resi encroaching kind of upon each other. We've kind of defined that as next gen, as you see in this slide. And ultimately, you know, in the early days, that was really defined by what co-living operators were doing the likes of uh, common in the States, Kind of corporate stays, uh, and you know, Nito and, and other students, right? So, taking a page of the playbook of hospitality to say, how do we create an environment where people want to stay and you know, effectively raise the bar? Um, and it's not just about product. It's not just about the developer just saying, well, we can, we'll build something and, and it will be occupied simply because of the supply and demand imbalance. It's about saying, well, let's think about it more holistically, uh, similar to, you know, how the sale guys are thinking about what are all the different elements from back of the house through to shared amenity spaces and then layering on different value add services that effectively en enhance and, you know, and create longer uh, longer revenue streams as tenants decide to, you know, renew their leases and stay. Um, so that sort of um, hotelification of the residential industry, we think is really important as you 
as you view the sector in general, right? Um, and trying to understand how will how will what operators um, will effectively um, internalize the right capabilities and the right technology and the right um, and and effectively the right the right staffing to be able to uh, raise that bar. Um, so if you go to kind of the next slide, one of the the points that you know we've talk about a lot is there's the element of provision of shelter right which hierarchy of needs incredibly important and of course we want to get that right um, and that's really important as it relates to kind of those aspects that are in the box but then also think about it as a product right so there's an element of design right that comes from the architectural input that comes from advisory input about like how to how to um, optimize um, the the opex and, and decrease leakage and then thinking about what are the different value add services that are appropriate based upon the locations that you might go into. Um, and then there is a vast array, as many of you know, of um, new prop tech businesses that are out there um, that you know, cover the entire spectrum of that project journey from acquisition through to stabilization and asset management. And there's a need, like you need to be able to speak that language and understand what, what is out there, what are the top businesses uh, and ultimately how do they plug in um, to a systems architecture that uh, allows you to generate the kind of uh, service that you might want and, and ultimately, you know, more holistically speaking, um, deliver a product that is sought after in the market. And again, I think these are the, the subtle elements that in, in the previous, especially if you look at the US and how the industry has kind of evolved since, since the 80s, as David outlined, and then to where we are today, there are these nuanced differences whereby now we have to be very thoughtful and, um, and, and kind of understand the acute contribution that these little elements uh, deliver to help you um, effectively create defensive uh, investment opportunities. So we think that's really important over time. I mean, effectively what we're doing is in internalizing a lot of that specialization in our team um, as it relates to kind of international housing uh, for Nuveen such that we can understand um, and really help drive value. And, and as we partner with developers and operators um, and, and go in that journey with them, we can be seen as someone that is up to speed and able to contribute um, you know, to those decisions. So that's, um, I think, from our side. And, and I guess as it relates to the Nordics, you know, we, we obviously, Nuveen being global and the footprint that we have in the living space in the US is, is quite large. We're growing that, again, most important sector for us. Um, going forward and um, and Europe and you know the Nordics have been a place where we've done one student deal recently um, in the last 12 months and we certainly feel like uh, from a multifamily or PRS perspective uh, it, you know a lot of the um, fundamentals are are very attractive in our eyes and we think that yet a lot of these um, elements still apply so you know it's we're, we're uh, identifying um, partners that we think align um, with how we see the world and, um, you know, want to go on that journey with us. Thank you, Bill. Uh, it's time now for, for Tord and, and Angus from Irish Surveillance. Yes, thank you very much, Svadir. And we're actually briefly leaving Bill's hotelification sector and, and the drivers behind that and, and walking into the dull Swedish sort of regulated area for regular residential. And a, a bit of a background for, for our international audience, I think we should, should in this uh, sort of uh, uh, context of, of, of living and housing, mention a few brief items and saying a, a rent negotiation system there is in Sweden sort of a, a, a basic a fundamental way of, of putting rents together for housing and that is a, a process which is led by the uh, market participants i.e. In generally the tenant association negotiating with the landlords association on a municipality level and the basis for the, the, the rent is the utility value of the property. So rent increases when you have that as a fundamental for all Swedish flats, then when you want to increase the rent, then you need to look at the utility value of the individual flat and also the increasing costs for managing that such flat. So as a, a, a landowner or, or, or a, a, a landlord, you can increase the rent 
as you like and you refurbish your flat to say I have a increased utility for this flat or for this stock of flats so I increase the rent. That is fine and you can go ahead and do that but what you always risk in Sweden is that the tenants subjected to that increase they turn to the local rent tribunal and they request which they always are entitled to a utility value review. So once you have increased, you have you argue for increased costs and you compare to other landlords, you have an increased cost, there is an inflation going on, so you need to increase. Okay, then the tenants, they, they might get a bit annoyed, so they turn to the local rent tribunal and they can then argue or, or hear the case where you argue as a landlord and the tenants argue and then the local rent tribunal will, will decide such case. That has been, been sort of a, 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 a driver for keeping rents down in city centers and also uh, putting the brake on, on, on newly produced units. So some, some almost 15 years ago now, there was a new system introduced which applies only to newly produced units where you do not need to look at the stock of flats around the entire country, but you could argue a separate deal with the Tenants Association for the increased costs for the newly produced. So then you go into this presumption rent system, which allows you as an investor 15 years with a separate deal, so to say, with the tenants, where you can, can amortize your investment or you could sort of get a higher profit. And after the 15, so we're approaching the end of the first 15 year period now, and that might, means that the first flats that went into the systems will soon uh, sort of leave it and be, be subjected to the general utility value system. That is sort of the basic uh, uh, background of the Swedish system. And Angus, may I please hand over to you? Thanks, Tor. Um, yes, we thought we'd just uh, run through a few themes that we've picked up uh, on doing sort of BTR developments in the UK, uh, comparatively to what we've been talking about in the US and Sweden. Um, I mean, one of the sort of main things, there's not, there's not regulation as such uh, in the UK, except through the sort of planning system that we have. Um, and so the sort of one issue around that is the sort of the number of flats that are, are created as built to sell, uh, but which are effectively PRS, um, as they are subsequently let by owners. Um, they're not the sort of same fitness for purpose as you would have in a, in a BTR scheme as the design is not so comparable. Um, I think one of the interesting things David said earlier, you know, 68% of, uh, of sort of the multifamily ownership in the US is, is private. Um, and I think the figure in the UK is something around about 97% of PRS landlords are, are private individuals. So the government has been trying to sort of um, get a more corporate approach to, to the development of BTR. Um, and to this end, they, they brought in the sort of government backed yeah, vehicle which was which was then um but i believe that's sort of coming to an end soon and they're looking for alternatives or, or maybe extend that um and i think the, the biggest sort of difference between the uk and sweden definitely is obviously we don't have uh, the rent controls that, that you have there meaning the sort of btr developers in the uk are free to set up as they wish and charge whatever the the rent the market can take uh, at that time and that's not always the best thing and i think we're we're finding that out at the moment in terms of the, the sort of the challenges. Um, just quickly on the sort of stats in the UK. Um, I mean, we all know one of the biggest sort of uh, issues in the UK is that an Englishman's home is his castle. Uh, and we all like to uh, own our own our own property in our homes. But, um, you know, young people can't afford it. Deposits are huge. And this is this is well, uh, well recorded. Um, London data at the moment is showing 79% of BTR tenants are aged 34 or younger, uh, and there are more younger people in BTR developments than in the wider PRS market. 62% um, of tenants uh, in BTR are aged 25 to 34, uh, whereas it's 47% uh, in the wider uh, PRS market. Um, affordability benchmark is 30% of income, uh, which is tracking approximately on that with, with BTR, but I have heard stats of 40 to 50% of, of people's income is spent uh, on, on, the, uh, on their rent. Um, some of that sort of balances out because obviously with the rent inclusive situation, people save money that uh, 
they otherwise might have, have put elsewhere. Um, and then in the UK, families are quite underrepresented in the in the BGR sector, but but we're aware of that and, and we're quite far behind, I think, where, where the US is. Um, challenges, I think, for the market are, you know, the, the BGR premium is, is considered too much at the moment. We need to find ways of reducing costs. So I think there's a lot of, uh, of sort of looking has been done at the amenity space usage. Um, you know, we put a lot of gyms in these buildings, um, which puts the, the cost of the rent up. And are we better off, you know, letting those to the gym operator reduce the rents, have some income? Um, people who live in the building can decide whether or not they want to use the gym or not. Um, and I think that's the sort of challenge at the moment is to find a, a, a more cost effective approach um, to some of the some of the schemes um, and see where we get with that. Um, and then just quickly, just wanted to mention planning. Um, there's no sort of designated BTR use in the uk um this is under constant debate there, there are planning reform proposals going through at the moment um an extensive consultation has has just finished which has all sorts of ideas around how we use uh section 106 contributions for instance which is a, a bugbear of a lot of btr development in the uk um and there's some interesting ideas around that which hopefully will come out and will encourage uh developers in that way but just to say you know the, the sector is producing nothing like America, but you know, it's, it's 10,000 homes a year um, on average, which is a, a substantial contribution to the housing supply. But you know, we could, we could get to a, a much better place with uh, some of these changes brought in and thought through. But uh, yeah, that was uh, it from me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Angus. And uh, with those uh, brief words from the legal and, and, and the, the London side, we will go over to Kent Parson, who is a director and uh, a political expert at uh, Heimstaden. Kent? Sorry, Kent before, you, before you begin, Kent, I would just like to remind the remaining speakers to pick up the pace a bit because we, we want to allow some time for a panel discussion afterwards. So. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Let me start with the obvious. Yes, the Swedish rental market is uh, politically regulated and it's more regulated than we can see in many other countries. Uh, what is primarily regulated in Sweden is the rent levels and the rent regulations. Tord talked about it and uh, that is one of the thing here in Sweden that is quite regulated. And if you look into the political leadership and the political uh, landscape, uh, there is no single that uh, this system will will change. Uh, I say it will be we it will be this way a long long time forward. With that said, it's of course both pros and cons with this system. The advantage of this system is that you actually know uh, how much the increase uh, of the rental level is uh, on the year forward. Uh, maybe it's too low, but you know that you can have increase every year. In a free market, with the free market rents, it can be reduced, and that is not the situation in Sweden. If we look at the challenges facing politics and the Swedish housing market for rental apartments, I should say, say there is mainly three challenges. The first challenge is uh, that it's a significant pressure within the Swedish housing market. The production of rental apartments and the housing is generally too low, and the population growth is outpacing the market. The homes that are being built are also far too expensive for the consumers with bi the biggest needs. Young people and immigrants, two groups, often in desperate need of housing, do not have the economy to move in these expensive, newly produced homes. The second uh, challenge is the renovation of existing real estate stock built in the 60s and 70s. There was a very large volume of rental apartments built during this period in Sweden. They are facing considerable renovation needs. And it's mainly public companies that own these real estates and they do, do not have the financial required to improve them or the areas which they are lo located in. If nothing is done about this situation, we will have a large uh, residential areas face the risk of becoming slums. This will obviously uh, have negative effect on, not only on the people living there, or it will be a problem for the whole society in Sweden. The third uh, challenge is uh, the growing social exclusion here in Sweden. Sweden differs from many other countries that we uh, don't have social housing in a formal way here in Sweden. 
At the time when uh, the social exclusion is growing and it involves more and more people in Sweden, the situation can very well be the biggest challenge for the Swedish politics. And uh, I'm sad to say the politicians have no clear solution to this problem at the moment. All in that, uh, the, I should say that there are big uh, and great opportunities for investors here in Sweden. Those who can invest and build cheaper rental apartments in the Swedish university city or large cities, they will have a great opportunity to do so. Capital is needed to renovate uh, the, these large Swedish residential areas. For investors who want to own and manage rental properties in the long term, there are likely large investment opportunities to make the coming years. For real estate companies that both want to and can be involved to take responsibility for solving so social sustainability, there are great opportunities to invest in the Swedish residential housing market. The threat to this is the general doubt in the political system towards private and foreign capital, and it seems as a risk to give them the opportunity to invest in the residential housing market here in Sweden. Finally, for those who want to invest in the residential housing market in Sweden, just good ideas, capital and strong owners are not enough. You must be able to convince the political stakeholders that you are in fact a long-term player who can and will take seriously responsibility both for real estate and their tenants. Thanks. Well, well summarized, I can't, very good. Thank you very much. Right, so on, on that we, we're coming on to basically we have three, three more speakers, so we <laughs> will have some time for the, the discussion, I hope. So on the kind of supply and demand, in the, particularly in Sweden, and uh, where the mismatches are, and uh, coming from a kind of old, dated uh, system onto the world of prop tech and solving inefficiencies, I want to uh, present again Mattia Tosti at uh, CASA. Uh, yes, hi everyone. So um, I'll try to keep it short. Uh, so my name is Mattia. I'm one of the founders of, um, of CASA. We are the largest rental marketplace in Sweden and in the Nordics, actually uh, part of Schibstedt Group. Uh, we operate Blocket Bostad in uh, Sweden. Uh, Tori in Finland and Finn in Norway, which basically are the the largest classified uh, uh, in terms of reach in each country we operate in. So um, there's a lot of data that we can uh, that we can um, um, that we can do a lot of cool things with. And I guess that's what I'm uh, in in that in that regards. That's that's what I'm here. Uh, that's why I was invited to this to this panel. Um, so we. Like our, our our perspective on that. So one, uh, one one thing that I should start saying is that Blocket uh, in Sweden is uh, mostly known for working with the private sublets, and uh, <clears throat> we're by far the largest uh, player in that sense. But we're actually and quite successfully also helping uh, professional property owners to allocate their vacancies, and and we do so by uh, by using that data that we have. So. Uh, one one simple uh, and I think one uh, data point enough uh, would be uh, there's five million applications that are sent on uh, our platform every year only in Sweden. That is uh, tenants that are actively looking for apartments um, with where we know exactly what they're looking for. Uh, we uh, we have their demographic, credit, and income information, um, and a lot of information basically of, with regards to what consumer demand um, looks like. And it can get down to a very granular, granular level. Um, so one, um, one, one example of what, what we can do with this data that we're doing today is uh, simply represented in this slide. Uh, so what you see here is, uh, uh, red bars is unique tenants that are looking for uh, gray bars, um, specific homes at different price points or, or uh, sizes in Stockholm. And of course, this is uh, this show this shows 
the imbalance that we we have in terms of of uh, supply matching demand uh, on a very uh, general level um it really gets it, it it gets truly interesting if if you start digging uh, deeper into um into smaller segments so uh, how does it look in specific postal codes or uh who are these tenants in these specific small areas uh, we, we we can we can look at uh, what's the credit worthiness uh, what other areas or other types of apartments have they shown interest in um, and, and so forth. And that's where, the, that's where the real insights are, which can be really, really powerful. And that's one, one, uh, um, one aspect that we'd, li we'd like to bring to the table when it comes to, uh, look, when it comes to talking about uh, what, how we can approach uh, build to rent in Sweden. Uh, to use the data that uh, that is out there, um, we believe is not being used enough, and there's a lot of it. Um, one other thing I'd like to point out when it comes to how how does the market how, do, how does the balance of the market look like uh, is a little a little of a nuance. Uh, so, uh, toward uh, we heard talk about the uh, different legislations when it came to um, uh, new production. Uh, so newly built, uh, newly built rent. We we working very closely with privates on the sublet market, uh, and on one hand, and working also with uh, with property owners uh, with newly produced homes, uh, can actually see that this uh, this imbalance that is very very strong when it comes to the re highly regulated markets uh, is uh, is much less so. Uh, when when it comes to the newly newly produced homes, those that market is much more close to the um, to to a, to a regular market uh, obeying to to market rules in a sense uh, than um, uh, than when the rest of the slightly dysfunctional in a sense Swedish market is. Um, one other thing I would like to put out there, I guess we'll talk more about this later, is. Uh, uh, Challenge. One thing that we're working a lot on, and that we think is, in a sense, the future of uh, of the the way we'll be working with rentals in Sweden uh, or in the Nordics going forward, uh, is uh, to try and and uh, address the inefficiencies that are uh, that are today a part of the, of the way the the uh, rental market is mediated, the way uh, property owners fill their vacancies. Um, that today is largely uh, done using uh, municipal queues, um, and uh, queues we believe are very inefficient, uh, and we are quite sure uh, that there are uh, smarter and better ways to do that. Uh, and uh, we uh, we know that by looking at, again at the tenant data, looking at what tenants are interested in, what they've been looking at before, uh, who they are, um, we can dramatically decrease costs in terms of, of tenant turnover uh, by, uh, by being more efficient in the allocation of, um, of, um, of vacancies. I, I agree. Th 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 thanks for that, uh, Mattia. And I think that uh, uh, beautifully uh, leads on to the new world world of uh, residential and uh, Magnus getting head of transactions of the Aberdeen Standard Investments was invested in new builds where uh, turnover of tenants sometimes might be an issue with high rents and less so with low rents. Yes, it sure can. Uh, thank you, Gunnar. Um, we at Aberdeen Standard Investments, we have been investing in residentials for over 20 years. And uh, nowadays we do most of our residential investments through our pan-European fund. Um, we've been active for one and a half years, roughly. And uh, during that period, we've invested in 33 assets in seven different countries across Europe, uh, five assets in Sweden. We have a portfolio of 1.1 uh, billion euros today or uh, as per August uh, of that we have 190 million invested in Sweden. Uh, one problem that we see uh, is that uh, there's a lack of good 
uh, objects, good investment objects. And as, as Kent pointed out, uh, we have a rent regulation system in Sweden that is uh, quite challenging. But I would say that in the markets that we are active in, we, we, I, would say, I should say also that we, we, uh, our 33 assets has been bought by cherry picking. So we, we are very particular on, on what we buy. Um, we tend to look at markets that are uh, lagging in, in uh, supply of apartments uh, uh, behind the, the general developments in, in those markets. And um, the rent regulation in Sweden is maybe not a problem in these areas. Uh, I would say that we have market rent in these, uh, in these area, really good areas. Uh, the rent regulation uh, sets a border on, on where, we can, uh, where we can have the rents, uh, but the rent that are allowed within the rent regulation systems are high enough to make it quite expensive for people to pay. So I would say that in, in our micro markets where we are active, we have a market rent today. Um, we look at, at micro locations in these cities. We invest more, more in cities than in countries. And the micro locations we pick by, um, we have coined a new version of the phrase AAA. We need uh, good accessible locations, uh, preferably, preferably by train. We need uh, amenities in, in these locations. So that means that we can't buy the first house in a new development scheme. We need to have schools, daycare centers, uh, stores and things. And we need also to have the affordable apartments for people to, to be able to rent. Um, and given the, the things I said before is that is a challenge. Um, and those high rents often lead to, in Sweden, we, we have a a fairly big demand for rentals. So it doesn't really lead to vacancies, but it will sure lead to turnover. And during the period of, of 20 years we've invested in, in residentials, we've seen turnover rents rise from, from somewhere around 10% to now around 30% in new production, which is a number that still is growing, I would say. And that comes from, from rental apartments being more of a temporary solution or new production rental apartments, more of a temporary solution for people's uh, um, uh, housing demands. Um, we have struggled to find solutions of, of keeping that turnover down, but um, it, it's really hard. What we've started to look at now is how to manage this turnover. And, and uh, Matthias' solution uh, with a, a more efficient queue is probably one thing to have to always have all apartments let, but have a smoother transition between tenants. Um, I would say half of all the investment we've done is uh, forward funding, and the other half being standing investments, and that's also a challenge uh, as a dividend-driven investor, uh, forward funding is, is a challenge uh, since you have uh, around two years of, of uh, not having a yield on, on the investments. So we're actively looking for good standing portfolios of new production, um, which is almost impossible to come by. Uh, I should mention that, that one of the, the better portfolios that we bought is, is a portfolio in Stockholm where we actually managed to secure two standing new, new built standing investments and one forward commitment. And that is a portfolio we bought from JM just a year ago. Um, and by that, I can hand over to Nicholas, maybe. Uh, I think Nicholas needs to be unmuted. Yes. Okay, yeah. better now. Oh, good. Okay. Uh, okay. I'm uh, Niklas, I'm the uh, head of Build to Rent at JM. Uh, for the moment, we uh, produce all our uh, rental apartments in Stockholm, but we, we can uh, build in whole Sweden. Um, JM has around seven to 8,000 apartments in production for the moment in the Nordic countries. Around 7% in Stockholm is rental apartments. We work, work uh, through from acquisition to project uh, development, production, and management. Um, but 
But our, our biggest challenge is to find land and get started with the, with the zoning plans to start pro projects. Yeah. There's a, a great demand on the rent, rental housings. Uh, we have an average of around eight years of queuing time within YAME, our new project. Um, that's quite nice, but um, and, and that's because we, we have a high standard and, and good quality in all our projects. Um, it's um, interesting to uh, hear about um, the turnovers that uh, Magnus uh, said earlier here. I checked this the last year in our portfolio, we have a 10 to 13 percent in the turnover this uh, last 12 months. And um, I think it, the reason because it's so low is um, we have a good average in our apartment sizes, sizes not uh, just small apartments. Um, and we uh, work really hard with um, a high uh, certified, high uh, certified uh, customer index from, from the start. Um, I think that's really important to uh, reduce turnovers and uh, also uh, lower the management costs. Um, yeah, that's uh, what I wanted to start with. Thank you, Nicholas. Uh, now a few few minutes of a panel discussion. We we might have to steal a few minutes uh, past four o'clock as well, uh, Swedish time, but. Uh, the, 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 the main question of the panel is what the Swedish residential sector will look like in, in 2040 and how do we get there? <laughs> it's a big question and, and uh, but as we have, uh, we don't have much time, I think we should just give everyone a, just a short comment on that. Uh, should we begin in, in the, uh, with, with Magnus perhaps? Yes, thank you, Sverre. Um, I think our goal to invest in, in uh, residentials is that uh, there's a low risk and uh, nothing really changes. So uh, one quite boring answer is, is that in 2040, everything will look, look almost the same as it does today. We're long-term investors. The things we're, we buy now, we will keep owning in 2040. And uh, obviously there's a lot of development going on on, on prop tech and um, these kind of areas so so there will be developments but in general uh, residential res residential apartments btrs that we are investing in will look almost the same and i think uh, as uh, previous speaker were was uh, was in on the rent regulation system will probably also look quite similar to what we have today and and the, by that, the challenges we face today will also be the same. The construction, the production rate is, is too low and uh, I can't really see any change in that either. Okay. Uh, yeah. one, one question to you, Magnus, and I, I would like to give it over to David then. Uh, when, when Blackstone sold uh, their Hembla, the, the Hembla portfolio, they, they realized a profit of $650 million in just three years, which was quite amazing. And, and, and uh, just due to the predictability of the market, which is what was their main, main object of entering. And I know that I have a certain <laughs> insight into the Aberdeen way of thought as well, that, that this is something that you, you cherish as well, the predictability. And, and is that, it yes. sounds like you're saying we will have that predictability going forward as well. Yeah, we, we need the predictability. Uh, in order to accept these low yields, we need to have, it, it's important that we have the, the um, uh, rents coming in every month, every year uh, for the, the overseeable future and uh, um, at a fairly low risk of uh, technical problems. So uh, by accepting the low rents, we, we need to have the, this predictable uh, cash flows. That's that's basically why people invest in, uh, in residentials today. And uh, as you say, there, there are chances. The things we bought in the early process of our fund, we could obviously sell today with a profit, but 
our investors uh, that are mainly institutional investors they they invest in our Airbnb fund for uh, for the dividend, not for the capital gains. Yeah, uh, David, you were in a, you were in pr predictability and institutional investment in the U.S. in, in the late eighties. I'm, I'm I'm thinking when when the likes of, of Aberdeen and Blackstone, big international players or institutional players, are coming into the market. How did that evolve the market in the U.S. in terms of of uh, technical standards in terms of standard of living affordability and so on. yeah it, it, it was it was really a pretty dramatic transformation in the US in the span of the last say 25 or 30 years um, the the apartment sector in the US was really what we would call a mom and pop business so it was mostly smaller buildings oftentimes uh, owned by local investors where you know two or three people would come together and put some money into a project <clears throat> and, and that really made up the the industry <clears throat> and then when the when some of these changes occurred that I mentioned before and institutional investment really started coming into the sector um, <clears throat> I know I know we're talking about over the span of 25 years but <clears throat> it's not that long of a period for an institutional asset class to really develop in the way that it has so my, uh, you know, obviously I come at this from a, a very U.S. perspective, but I think those lessons learned in the U.S. will will occur in the U.K., in Sweden, in the Nordics, across Europe, perhaps more quickly because we have we have you know we have a model that we can look at. And the one thing I would say, and I'm certainly not an, an expert in in Sweden, but if you if we take a step back. We keep talking about these low yields and, and how it's very challenging, which is all very true. But again, look at the direction of travel of, of capital. What is the office sector going to look like in the next 20 years or 30 years? What is the retail sector going to look like? <clears throat> Residential is a, is a basic need. That doesn't go away. People need a place to live. And I was talking to a, a, a big institutional client the other day, and they were talking about multifamily as in terms of infrastructure, like you would talk about a road or a bridge or a tunnel, basic societal need that you can't, you can't live without. And, and if you look at the way infrastructure returns work, uh, I think multifamily, you know, even, in, even with very low yields, there will be institutional capital that starts to see that this is a good place to put, put money long-term. So I think it's, it's a, it's a bit of stepping back from how we've seen real estate investing historically and how we might see it going forward. Okay, thank you. Good. Yeah, uh, I can just say uh, we we are going to continue this um, kind of panel uh, discussion a little bit. So I hope people can stay with us a little bit longer. Uh, it is being recorded and the film will be sent out. Uh, so you won't lose that completely if you're, if you're curious afterwards. And our contact details, as posts, will be shared. So any direct questions um, or ideas, so just pick up the phone or, or send an email. Uh, we're happy to discuss. It's a subject we love talking, obviously, <laughs> about. Anyway, so I will continue with this, if it's okay with everyone, and uh, drop out if you need to. So uh, um, a question to Kent, uh, you talked about old stock, uh, will it really be refurbished? So if we're looking 20 years into the future, will it be, have been refurbished? And is rents in old and new stock more similar and more based on location and the actual demand, attractiveness for this? Or will it remain just politically illogical at times? A great question, but I think it will uh, look like uh, it looks like today, because the political system is uh, is not ready to do the the big changes. So uh, what Magnus just said, I, I have the same uh, picture as, as Magnus. It will not happen a lot uh, in the political system. The political system in this issue is quite robust. Uh, so if you want to invest in Sweden, this is uh, how it looks like. Uh, the problem, I should say, the, the problem is, is uh, the new building, because uh, it's tough to, to get uh, capital to it, uh, but it's very tough to get uh, the group that needs uh, residential to rent them. Yeah. 
and I think the solution to that is that uh, Sweden needs social housing, uh, and the political uh, the political system must take a debate on how will uh, social housing in Sweden look like. Right now, the political system don't want to talk about it, but I think they need to talk about that. Uh, Kent, uh, just a big a long follow up question on, on the topic that we discussed earlier and and if uh, Heim is also a, a sort of an institutional investor, how, how can you affect the system from within, so to speak? Uh, we are one of the biggest private private uh, residential companies in Sweden right now, 30,000 residential we have in Sweden. Uh, so, uh, of course, we're talking to the political system uh, all the times, but I think the positive uh, thing about the political system in Sweden and, and that it's regulated is, you know uh, what the yield, uh, what the yield are. It's low, but you know what the yield are. Uh, and these times with very low rents, this is uh, quite a good investment. Yeah, fair enough. Um, yeah, we have questions from the audience. Uh, I would just like to, to let them in. Kai Wirta has a question to no one in particular, but uh, uh, I'm going to read it. I have a question or reflection regarding the possible market rent for rental residential properties in larger cities, such as Stockholm. Would the market rent be the rents we see on subletting on, for example, Blocket? There may there we may see a rent per month at uh, fifteen thousand for an apartment with one room and a kitchen, so quite quite above the 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 negotiated rents. Uh, I think Magnus and Kent perhaps and and Mattia who are well well into the market. Uh, I can I guess start maybe. Um, <sighs> As as you said, hi Kai. Um, as you say, the the second hand market has a dramatically higher rent than than the first hand market, but the gap is is reducing because the uh, new new rents in new developed apartments is is getting higher and higher, and by the week and by the month. Uh, but if we were to push the market all the way to where the second hand market is, uh, I think that we would see the turnover skyrocket and sky turnover is always connected to to cost in our world so so even if we were allowed to uh, charge these secondhand uh, letting rents uh, i think the benefit of that would uh, at least in part be uh, consumed by the, the higher costs and higher maintenance in those uh, these apartments so that would more of a be more of a uh, i would say um, hoteling, ho hotelification concept uh, in, in our, our residentials. And that's not what we're looking for. We, we are, as, as we say, we need long-term stable income and foreseeable stable income. Uh, <clears throat> I agree with that. One, one nuance uh, to, it, to that as well is uh, uh, you talk about market rents and, uh, and you look at Lockett and you, uh, and you look at the, the myth of these, uh, these very very high uh, rents that are asked for for some some edge cases and uh, the reality is that uh, this example we hear it a lot but it's not reflecting uh, what actually is the market rent on the subletting market uh, and it's not reflecting what the what what a market rent would look like um, were the market to be deregulated, which, uh, as both Magnus and Kent said, is not going to happen anytime soon. Um, I mean, market, the, the, the market rent is, will at the end be a reflection of, of the purchasing power of the, of the tenants. And um, I don't believe that all Stockholm tenants have that kind of purchasing power. So uh, rents will, will go up, but definitely not. In my in my opinion, to to those to those uh, those levels, so affordability is the key. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, will uh, will you see that the uh, prop tech and data will uh, kind of drive this more and more towards the hospitality sector? It's more and more becoming a service sector. That uh, like everything else, you can do on on apps and, uh, and online. That you basically have higher. 
as the tenant, you have higher expectations of the service that you get in your own. And it's this moving towards a, uh, the kind of build to rent model where more services and amenities Yes, I think that's. Uh, I think that that is maybe because the market is or the rents are so regulated. Working with those kinds of services will be a way to to uh, uh, increase uh, value creation or you know the value for the tenants and uh, and uh, um, you know profits. Um, not being able to to increase rents, you can uh, you can do other things. Uh, one other one other aspect of of data, I think uh, I was I touched upon it earlier, is I think expectations from the tenants tenant side uh, to um, um, like uh, to to overcome the the inefficiencies that we see today, where uh, it's really difficult for for tenants to access the market. Uh, for someone to to uh, get a contract in Stockholm, you need to stand in line between ten and ten and twenty years. Uh, that makes it totally inaccess inaccessible to to um, uh, tenants that are moving to the city. Um, that happens oftentimes to have quite high purchasing power too. Um, so I think expectations are by the tenants uh, on. Uh, data helping the market find uh, find them would be uh, one defining element um, in the future. We have one question from uh, the audience from Dominic Martin to to Bill Bateman on, on a similar subject. Will will or are tenants paying more for built to rent properties that have amenities and services? Is is there a premium rent? In those I think the short answer, yeah, and and. and my opinion, thank you, Dom, by the way, um, I think it's yes. I mean, the question is how much, and, and obviously you need to be aware of the dangers of the amenity arms race, right? Like don't, don't build something just for the sake of building it, whether it's for PR or just because it maybe seems like it's cool and differentiating for the product. I think that the need to be thoughtful about what the different services and amenities are that are being offered I mean, is, is key. And, and trust me, we are very focused like everyone else on affordability. Um, but we think that affordability can still sit alongside of um, amenity and, and service. And one of the things that we see with prop tech and that integration and thoughtful, call it guest service or tenant services, is that it doesn't necessarily have to imply a huge increase in your OPEX. Right, and part of this is through thoughtful design, and then thought of part of it is just through centralization of your operating company, and and obviously some of that comes with scale. Um, but you know, if you think about what is the core element, going back to kind of the slide that I had before, someone's willing to pay for shelter, right? So I'm willing to pay for a box that sits in a certain location and has the needs that that you know that meet what I'm looking for. And then there are other things that are starting to layer over that uh, oftentimes, and we see this, so we're partnered with Common, which is a leading co, again, co-living provider in the US, but has actually turned into what we consider uh, a thoughtful multifamily operator, the kind of the next generation multifamily operator. So while they started with um, an approach, which was more looking at traditional or legacy multifamily, repositioning that product, making it just an, a nicer product, but then taking the, the digital and the kind of the tech infrastructure to be able to enhance um, both product that and offering that's on site, but also something that is digitally available, they're seeing much stronger results and also an increase on a, in terms of NOI per square foot. So that yeah. in and of itself for us, we have tangible proof that that works. Um, and I think again, co-living is in many ways leading that charge because you're generally thinking about smaller spaces with more shared amenity, but Common took that to the next level and said, well, why don't we try to create a brand that focuses on a younger uh, family generation? So they created Ken. And what did Ken do? It said, well, let's centralize the spaces that young families need. So you have a crash and you have uh, an outsourced nanny service that can be uh, basically um, uh, accessed at a price that's much more 
uh, attractive than if you went out and ended it on yourself by yourself. So effectively what they're saying is let's purpose build a space and let's try to layer in the offering that these people are looking for and, and create community on top of that. And by doing that, you create a premium again. And, and if you tried to break that down into each level of service, you know, I think you could kind of apply that and say, well, I'm getting that at a marginally cheaper cost than if I had to go out and do it on my own, it's all under one roof. So we talk a lot about share of wallet. And if I'm captive to a building and I can get everything in a much easier way and a, at a similar, if not better uh, quality, that is as it relates to kind of service, then of course I'm gonna do that. And then if that flows through to the operator and then ultimately to me as an asset owner, then I'm happy, right? Um, so I, I think, again, maybe that's a long-winded answer, but I think that, that that's generally our view. I, mean, I can just fill in there and say, uh, at Colliers, we did for many years, uh, or four years in a row in UK, a big uh, research on the 125 built-to-rent schemes, or to some extent built-to-rent. And uh, the average figure was about 10%, all being equal to a built-to-sell scheme that's rented out on, on market rent versus a scheme that was wholly owned and professionally managed was about 10%. But it, of course, varies a lot. So here's a, a, um, kind of no, maybe a question to Felici, uh, that, uh, uh, and maybe to ask, and Felici get asked, this demand for the kind of percentage of optimal amount of amenity space. So what I'm saying is that, for example, on a, uh, a thousand square meter scheme or ten thousand square meter scheme uh, how many percent it should be allocated to amenities in a free market and then what should be absolute minimum even in a regulated market just for decency so we we've, we've done benchmarking i was saying on all of our schemes um, and obviously they're sort of wide ranging in terms of the number of apartments for each um, but they varied. So we based it as a comparison to the overall net internal area of all the apartments. Um, and the amenity space varied anywhere between about 2% um, to about 7%. Um, so it's quite a big difference. And I would say that the main difference was depending on the location of the scheme um, and also the sort of price points um, that, and, and the, the sort of, client on that what I would say on the amenities is I completely agree with what Bill was saying before it's not the arms race to amenities it's finding the right amenities but what we found as well is um, thinking about it in a flexible sort of way because if you have an operator who's going to be uh, sort of the long-term owner in 40 years time how do we know what we're going to be wanting or needing, you know, we didn't know about COVID last year. Um, so we somehow have to be able to adapt and evolve. And I, we've seen that in some, um, some projects. We, for example, have created a gym, which is only, you know, 75 square meters because actually it could be replaced by an apartment if there were no takers in the future. So it's sort of thinking about it in a way that almost having a long-term program of how these spaces could evolve and adapt um, for different uses. Uh, and this flexibility, would that apply to apartment sizes too, you reckon, in terms of flexibility and stand the test of time for the future? Yes, uh, ideally, yes. Um, it's not it's always possible, today. though. Um, I think for the, what we've, what we've found is probably about, you know, eight years ago say we were all talking about the dumbbell apartments which are ideal for sharers so that there's two bedroom apartments it's like the apartments that you see in in the series friends you know they all have a shared living space which they access and then equal sort of rooms that are accessible from that shared space um, each with a bathroom and what we found is that actually we need a bit more variety that works for people that are sharing but actually it's not necessarily the majority of the demographic so we also need to have two bedroom apartments that are going to work for um, a couple that either have a baby or want to work from home and they don't want a second bedroom which is large with a bathroom as well they want to pay slightly less um, but but they still want a bit of extra space so I think in the apartments it's really what we really like is working with um, advisors like GA, for example, or um, operators in the first place to really work out the demographics for the place and to think about it in the long term so that we know we'll be able to adapt. So, 
Okay. Good. Right. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to ask it, Nicholas a question. Maybe you can add on to that uh, after David. I just want to make sure that uh, this comes up. I just, I just wanted to make one quick comment on demographics because Felici just mentioned. And I think it's really important that, that any BTR offering starts with understanding who the tenants really are going to be. Um, I mean, what we've seen is a very high percentage of couples um, we, we have sharers, we have different, different household uh, makeups. And in many cases, there are two incomes. So the whole affordability piece uh, really needs to be analyzed against that backdrop of, of who the renters are gonna be. Um, and, uh, and in many cases where in markets we're working in where there historically has been a lot of build for sale and not so much built to rent, developers too often revert back to what has been built in a build for sale environment. And in a built to rent environment where people may only stay for a few years and then move on, uh, it can be a different unit mix, which really can change the uh, investment returns. So it all, it all has to start with that market research of where the demand's gonna come from. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, uh, Nicholas, Jim, uh, very impressive figures from you, like an eight year queue and uh, a very low turnover. And from a, uh, if that was a free market, then one would say, oh, just increase the rents. But uh, have, have you pushed the rents as much as you can? And uh, uh, yeah, that's the best question. Um, it's a, a go chat the presumptions rents in these projects. Um, but um, we haven't uh, extended them to the, to the limit, but uh, it's, um, so negotiation with an uh, with a uh, tenant association. So um, it's like the market is today. So uh, it's quite stable for a uh, developer as well to. And uh, and are you adopting any of these kind of built to rent trends in terms of having some level of communal areas or shared space? or amenity space or back of house uh, space or on-site staff, any of that uh, that is changing? Uh, no, because, because uh, the cost, uh, the rent cost will be uh, too high for the uh, yeah. apartments. So uh, we don't uh, do that. We have some, uh, what, what do you say, uh, more environmental, Things like car poles, uh, spaces for um, cargo bikes, things like that to uh, make it easier for uh, transportations and uh, for the, for our tenants. Got it. Um, so, uh, from uh, your perspective, Niklas, what what is uh, going to be the main difference if we look at today and if we look twenty years ahead? Uh, what do you think JM will change? Is it sustainability? Uh, kind of making different buildings there. I will just say it's just sustainability. Um, much of the other things is uh, political de decisions, so it's uh, quite hard to. Uh, um, we have to uh, what to say. Uh, follow the politicians, but in sustainability, uh, I think we'll do a lot, um, both socially and uh, and environmental. A question to uh, Bill, perhaps. Um, you, would you say there is in, say, free markets um, uh, compared to regulated markets? If, uh, uh, if we, for example, US and UK and rest of Europe and Sweden, as you look at all of the different countries, would you say there's a big difference in type of investors and type of operators in these regulated, respectively unregulated markets? And do you think that will, will change? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I mean, and I guess if you look at the more highly regulated markets, um, you certainly have some operators that are appearing that again, qualify as next generational and are thinking about some of these core elements that we've been speaking to. Um, I think sure, yeah. If you say the 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 more free or open markets maybe allow for um, uh, 
a, a little bit more value creation opportunity um, and, and therefore that drives some of the kind of entrepreneurial spirit, maybe if you want to frame it that way. I, I think that might be fair. Um, that said, again, and, and David talks about this from time to time, I and mean, you can certainly look at markets in the states that are still, you know, that on a, on a sub-market basis, they can still be relatively highly re regulated in, in, in some ways. So I, I think you just have to be creative about how you deal with the regulation. And I, I'm you know, certainly not a, an expert of, about regulation, for instance, in Sweden, and I'd have to depend on um, my, my colleagues there to really help me understand the nuances. But I think that doesn't change fundamentally the, I think the, the desire, um, the underlying kind of desire or consumer needs um, that you, you need to meet. And I, and I think we've looked at different markets and tried to be thoughtful about how you can comply with regulation, but still monetize potentially additional services um, in different ways, right? That are still, uh, it's, you know, that's effectively compliant, right? Yeah. And um, I appreciate the time is ticking, uh, ticking away. Uh, I guess it's fair to say uh, that people, in, at least on this panel, believe that the residential is here to stay, <laughs> i.e. people will need a roof over their head, and uh, uh, even the institutional interest is likely to, to just uh, increase for this sector as well, uh, which might suggest uh, higher prices, although it depends a bit on uh, on the political agenda. Um, the sector is being professionalized and uh, the tech sector is, is waking up to the opportunities and uh, tracking of, uh, of data and analyzing data might uh, be able to reduce some of the mismatching that's happening or people not ending up with the homes that's suitable for them. Um, Sverre, do you want to add a few conclusive points before we pass over to Linda? Yes, I think the I think the 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 common denominator in the, in the discussion has been the the predictability, affordability, and that things will not change too much due to the regulatory environment. And and I think that of course there are there is room to operate within the regulations, but they are they do form some kind of a boundary to, to work within, but the but in 2040 it's only 20 years away, but probably we won't see so so much differences to to today's market. Uh, and and there is uh, as in the in the UK and the US, there's quite a big need for, for new residentials in Sweden. So I guess we'll have to see see what happens. Oh, so, uh, yeah, th thank you everyone. Before I pass over to Linda, I mean, the, the panel at least, you have each other uh, as a contact detail, so please uh, carry on the, uh, the discussion if you wish. Uh, uh, I'm always a phone call away, so <laughs> sorry you thought. <laughs> and uh, yeah, thank you. And th thanks, Froga uh, Lou, for, for arranging this and making the, this work. Certainly not uh, not to thank for the technical parts of this. So, Linda. Thank you, Gunnar. Uh, thanks to everyone who's listened. I hope you enjoyed the session. We hope to see you again soon, if not in real life, at least at one of Frogalo's upcoming webinars or post uh, podcasts. As mentioned earlier, the session today has been recorded and we will distribute it to all attendees. Uh, please pass it along if you find it interesting. Uh, we will also uh, send our contact information should you want to continue the discussions. We wish you all a nice evening and thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.